Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the 286 Project with me, Chris Akers. And on this podcast, we talk about arts, culture, politics, sport, and anything else we can think about. Now, we've done one true crime episode before. I decided to do another true crime episode, and I'm delighted to have uh, Don Shredley onto our podcast. Um, he's going to talk about his latest book. Um, hello, Don. Hello, Chris. Good to see you. Good, uh, and likewise, likewise. Um, before we get into it, um, can you just explain to our audience who you are, um, how long you've been writing for, and what led you to write your um, latest book? Well, I've been writing a long time. Uh, I started out as a sports writer about uh, a little more than 20 years ago. And I worked for uh, a lot of different publications. Uh, for a short time, I worked for ESPN. Um, I worked for a lot of boxing publications. Uh, gradually, over the years, uh, I did develop an interest in uh, crime stories and eventually my publisher who, who had uh, he had published a bunch of boxing books that I wrote and we started kicking around ideas for a project and we both came from the Boston area a little bit north of Boston in Massachusetts and we both remembered a case that involved a professor from Tufts University who got in big trouble for killing a sex worker uh, in the Boston area. And the case back in the 80s uh, was it was a big deal. And my publisher and I, we both remembered it, how we used to get up in the morning and read about it in the newspaper or watch it, uh, the, you know, on, on the television news at night, because it became an ongoing story. Uh, the, the sort of story that uh, only certain crimes become. Um, and it, it was always interesting interesting to me why some crimes really capture the public's imagination and other crimes just kind of come and go and you don't really learn much about them while other crimes it's you know front page news for for days and days and days mm -hmm. especially back then it's changed a bit now the way news is delivered mm -hmm. uh but this case was a big deal and my publisher and i thought that might be one to revisit uh, before so much time passes that nobody remembers it, because that happens too with, with, with historical things. And the book was called Boston Tabloid, it came out uh, uh, late last year. Um, and it's been uh, a real interesting uh, experience to write the book and also watch how people have reacted to it. Yeah, it's um, a really interesting read. Um... Obviously, I mean, I've got my copy here and it's been, like I said, very compelling. I just wonder, you heard about your the crime from your childhood, but why was it, I mean, there's been, must have been plenty of crimes around Boston at that time. Why is it about this particular crime that makes it so compelling? Well, uh, I, I explore that uh, in the book. Um, also, you know, trying to understand why some crimes just, you know, like a hit song, it gets to the top of the charts yeah. and it just stays there forever, you know, and other good songs come and go. You forget them. Uh, I think there were a couple of reasons for this particular case to catch on. One was that it was a professor, a man named William Douglas, and he was a highly esteemed professor at uh, Tufts University, the medical school. He was renowned. He was uh, well known across Europe. He was involved in a lot of uh, uh, biological experiments, working with tissue cultures and uh, working with infant illnesses. And he was uh, a, a well known, highly regarded professor, very esteemed in his field. But he had a secret life where he liked hanging out in the dirtiest of neighborhoods <laughs> and uh, uh, picking up prostitutes. 
Um, and he became obsessed with this one particular sex worker, a woman named Robin Benedict. Uh, and he, he eventually uh, murdered her and hid the body. And no one ever found the body. Um, so there was that element of this well-regarded man living this secret life. And, and that's always uh, a, a news maker, you know, when, when someone is uh, brought low, you know, these, these people of high status are, are brought low. People love to read that they, they have this criminal side, you know. Um, and ironically, the, uh, the young woman that, that he murdered, she also had a double life. Uh, she had been uh, an art student, um, living a, a very clean cut life, or so everybody thought, but she was living a second life as a prostitute. So you had two people living secret lives, and that created uh, really like a TV movie kind, kind of an element, you know. Um, and so th those were the uh, two big reasons why it became such a, a sensation uh, and it also it took place in an area of boston that no longer exists uh it was uh, a series of streets and neighborhoods that was referred to as the combat zone and it was uh it was an area where the prostitutes worked and the drug dealers worked and a lot of uh, criminal activity went on and the state had actually designated this area, saying, if you want to do this kind of activity, you want to sell pornographic material, this is where you can do it. So it was kind of an experiment that backfired. Um, you know, when you give uh, criminals a place to play, <laughs> you know, they, they were not going to restrict themselves to this area. And gradually it started spilling out all over the city. And uh, prostitution was a, was a massive problem in Boston uh, in the 70s and 80s uh, to the point where it really affected businesses, uh, where people would not come into the city because, you know, chances are you would be accosted by a, a, a sex worker or a pimp or a drug dealer or, or you know, some some kind of uh, underworld character was going to approach you and your family as you were, you were shopping for Christmas presents, you know? Um, so it started to affect the city, this, this neighborhood called the combat zone. And a lot of the story takes place in the combat zone. So people who had never been there were able to read about it now. And it was sort of a window into a part of Boston that nobody knew about outside of the state. And what was interesting to me was interviewing uh, journalists who had come into the city from out of state, people from Florida, people from uh, out on the West Coast, people from New York. Reporters were coming in to cover the story. And they would tell me, they would say, you know, I've been to Times Square in New York. I've, I've been to the worst parts of Miami. I've never seen anything like the combat zone, you know, they would tell me that. So that gives you an idea of how rough this area was. And that's where this, this mild mannered professor <laughs> would spend his evenings, you know? So yeah, there, there were a bunch of elements that combined to, to make the story uh, really quite memorable uh, in, in, in the eighties. Uh, anybody who was around at the time remembered it, you know? Uh, and of course, anybody who was too young and not around at that time, it means nothing to them. You know, they, they don't remember it at all. You know, so that was interesting too, that, you know, once the window closes on uh, an event, on a part of history, it, it doesn't really stay in, in the, uh, you know, the mass consciousness, you know. So I, that's another reason I wanted to revisit, you know, just to get, remind people, hey, this big crime happened and it was a big deal. And if you don't remember it, here it is. <laughs> yeah. Um just going back a minute to the two protagonists, so you had William Douglas reading about him. Yes, he was married, he had children, but from a young age, he seemed to be very socially awkward. And it's as though he picked his wife to almost reflect that awkwardness socially. Would that be an accurate description of him? Yeah, yeah, you bring up a good point. He he uh, he was awkward. He 
he was uh, almost almost a cliche. He was the sort of lonely, overweight kid, you know, growing up very isolated. Uh, he lived in upstate New York for most of his childhood, um, and not, and he was not a particularly bright kid either he, he you know was certainly not the star of his class and it wasn't until he discovered science when he was well into his teens mm -hmm. suddenly he had you know he 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 had some power now he he had something that he could latch on to and it gave him maybe not a personality i don't think he ever had a personality yeah. but it gave him an edge gave him a little bit of uh you know what, what the kids would say, swagger. It gave him some swagger now, you know. Uh, he became a top scientist. And he did marry a woman who was, uh, she was a nurse. She was very meek. I think uh, she catered to him in a lot of ways because he had become this kind of academic superstar and, and a star in the world of, of uh, science. She was... Uh, you know, very complimentary. A guy like him needed a, a woman like her. You know, that was definitely uh, part of the chemistry. But of course, he had that dream life that he had. And I, I think once he started thinking, I'm a big shot scientist, you know, uh, he wanted a younger woman, a more beautiful woman. And of course, because he was a bit clumsy and awkward, he had to pay for it, you know. He had to uh, hit the streets and pay for it. Um, he was not going to find a woman like Robin Benedict on his own, just going to nightclubs and hanging out. You know, he, he, he had to pay for it, do it the hard way. So that's William Douglas. And again, with Robin Benedict, the stereotypical um, way in which you view sex workers are from a broken home, et cetera, et cetera. But that wasn't really... Uh, Robin's um, background. In fact, she actually came from a quite affluent home, if I recall. It was a, a nice, you know, they always presented it as sort of, a, you know, the all-American kind of background where she was very active in school projects and um, was a, a member of various clubs related to the school, you know, and, and um, what was interesting to me was although she came from, uh, you know, a, a nice, respectable family, the town she lived in had a really rough side. Uh, and it was uh, north of Boston. And at the time, there were communities up there that were really hit hard with the drugs and uh, prostitution. Uh, and, and a lot of people hadn't really tapped into that uh when the story first happened they really promoted her as kind of a clean-cut kid who was led astray by these uh, unsavory types and but from what i learned um she did come from a nice family but it was a rough rough neighborhood and she saw prostitutes you know on her way to school she would see prostitutes you know, on the street. So I wondered, you know, how that affects someone when they're growing up and they see that, you know, you can make money this way in the sex trade um, or through sort of criminal activities. You know, even, even the nicest people can be kind of uh, sucked in by that kind of atmosphere, you know. And I, I think that was... Uh, you know, possibly part of how she ended up in, in the sex world. Um, and I, I did speak to some people who knew her. I was lucky that I found one, a woman who had gone to school with her and knew her and said she was such a sweet kid. Um, but she got, she was tangled up with older, an older crowd, you know, and was easily manipulated by this older crowd. So it was just, you know, an, an unfortunate series of events that led her into prostitution. You'll wonder if she had met different people, would her life turn out differently? Possibly, you know, um, a, a lot of life is uh, luck, either good or bad. And it seems she had the bad luck to meet some bad people. 
And she was so young. She was only 20, 21, you know, a little bit naive, perhaps. And because she was very attractive, uh, people thought, you know, oh, she was a smart girl. She knew what she was doing, you know. But I always lean back on her age. She was very young and probably easy to manipulate. And I do think she had a, a big interest in money. I think that was um, a big issue, too. I think, you know, she liked the money. She wanted to make a lot of money fast. And in this professor, she saw an easy target. Yeah. Um, just before we get to the meeting between um, Robin and uh, William, obviously she had a pimp who was JB. So can you just explain um, a little bit about JB and also how did those um, JB and Robin meet? And weren't they engaged to be married before? Uh, yeah, she met this fellow, um, <clears throat> uh, JR. Uh, so the, his, yeah, yeah. His his nickname was Junior, and he was sort of a, a small time pimp who had maybe one or two ladies working for him, and and his whole his whole method of operation was to find one girl rather than have a you know a big stable of girls as as pimps uh, used to do and probably still do. He liked to get just one girl and kind of have her be a, the money maker, you know. And when he met Robin, he thought, okay, here's another money maker. So he would move out <laughs> the girl that he was currently using and and bring in Robin. Um, and they met in a strange way. Uh, she was actually dating a, a professional uh, football player uh, from the New England Patriots. Um, now, nowadays, the Patriots are a huge, huge uh, entity, you know, but back then, the, the Patriots were kind of a, a scrappy little team. They, they had not discovered the Super Bowl yet. You know, they were not they were not superstars back then. And the Patriots actually came to her high school for a function. You could never get them to do that now. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know. Uh, 40 years ago, the, the Patriots came to her high school and she ended up befriending one of the players and, and moving in with him, which shows you that she had, uh, you know, her eye on the prize. You know, she was um, focused, you know, and she saw she, she she looked she was always looking for a way out of her station, you know, and she saw this football player and thought, OK, here's my way out. So she latched on to him. And where football players are, or professional athletes, you will often find drug dealers and pimps, you know, and escorts and sex workers. You'll find a lot of that on the fringe, uh, wherever the athletes are. And uh, um, it was through her connections with this uh, football player where she was at a party and that was when this pimp junior uh first saw her and wanted to meet her and and she eventually broke up with the football player and ended up with this pimp and the details are a little bit shady no one knows the exact moment where she agreed to become a prostitute um but uh it was again just circumstances leading her into the hands of, of these kind of low down people you know she went from she went from being a high school girl to the girlfriend of a football player yeah. to a pimp <laughs> you know it was yeah. I, and again that's why i say she was naive she was young making bad choices and the bad things happened yeah so obviously we've um William Douglas and Robin Benedict, they would have met in the combat zone. So where exactly in the combat zone did they meet? And what was it about um, Robin that enamored William to her? Well, they met at a, 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 a small place called Good Time Charlie's. Yeah. And uh, 
and it, it, I always thought that was a funny name for the place because that's, <clears throat> I don't know if that's in, in England, but in America, that's an expression of like a guy who likes to party a lot. Yeah. They yeah, would call yeah. they call, Oh, it's a good time, Charlie, you know? Um, so this club was called good time Charlie's and it had been a controversial place. The police were always, uh, you know, busting it, you know, and, and, uh, there were problems going back years and it was also the kind of place that was apparently it was quiet. It was quiet enough that a man like Bill Douglas could go in and buy a drink and just sit there all night and not be bothered by anybody, you know, and I think that was why he liked the place. Um, he had tried some other spots along the combat zone and apparently had bothered a few women, but they were smart enough to see him for what he was. You know, he's a weirdo. <laughs> and they, 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 wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't give him an opening, you know, to, to, to become obsessed, you know. So he started going to Charlie's, just sitting by himself, quietly um just this sort of large lump of a man sitting in the corner by himself and that was where robin was and chances are you know junior had suggested she become familiar with good time charlie's uh because it was really the center of activity in the combat zone it was almost like it was uh uh, you know, what do you call it? The nexus or the nucleus and everything else kind of spreads out from there. You know, um, if, if there were 500 prostitutes in Boston, 200 of them were, were at Charlie's, you know? Uh, and so she became uh, one of the girls at Charlie's and, you know, she was probably friendly to Douglas you know, that was part of her methodology was um, to be friendly, be friendly to the older guys, you know, because he was old enough to be her father. Um, and there is a certain type of sex worker who, you know, works the older guys, you know, because uh, they have a little money and they're probably a little less, uh, you know, rough. Uh, the younger guys might get drunk and a little hostile and violent. The older guys are a little more mellow and they have a little money. So there were certain sex workers who focused on the older guys, you know. And uh, from what I found out, and I mentioned this in the book, um, the first few times they, they met, you know, she would talk to them for a while and then have one of her friends come in and close the deal, yeah. you know. Uh, it was almost like she put him through a test, you know, <laughs> and when her friends would come back and say, yeah, he's OK. You know, it's just, uh, you know, this middle aged professor who likes a little action on the side, you know, mm -hmm. then Robin decided, OK, now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to move in now. Mm -hmm. So she kind of let the other girls test him out in a way. So she was cagey in her own way. You know, she was naive, but she was cagey. Um, and she may have learned that from Junior. You never know. Um, and yeah, so that was how it started. Just, you know, some friendly conversations. And, you know, she probably told him the story about, you know, I'm really an art student. I'm not really a sex worker. You know, I'm only doing this for a little while. You know, that whole thing, you know, and and he took almost a fatherly interest at first, you know, he would, he became so uh, uh, involved with her. He started doing her taxes. He started, uh, you know, taking care of like little business things for her. He had business cards made up, you know, uh, it was, it was, um, it was a weird relationship. It was not entirely sexual, which is another strange thing that, you know, he liked prostitutes for the obvious reasons, but when he became obsessed with her, it became less about sex and more about him wanting to kind of 
rescue her, maybe, you know, get her off the streets. Maybe, you know, I think he maybe had fantasies of helping her, you know, find a job and becoming a, you know, a respectable member of the community. I think that was in the back of his mind. Um, and from what I've read, you know, psychological reports of, of other people who become uh, obsessed with, with sex workers, they do have that interest in, you know, rescuing the fallen woman. That, that's, that's a big part of the uh, fantasy that a lot of guys have. And I, and I think Will Douglas had it too. So you talk about his fantasy he has of wanting to rescue her and put her in a job. And in a kind of way, he actually did that because not only was he giving her money, his own money, but he was actually putting her on retainer as part of expenses at the university as well. How did that come about? Because surely didn't someone notice thinking, hang on, who is this person being classed as a lab assistant in the in, um, university? Oh, yeah. He, he was, uh, you know, embezzling, you know, from the school. He put her on the payroll as his assistant, mm -hmm. you know. And because she was an art student, he would say, she's doing illustrations for me. I'm, I'm preparing a book about some study he was doing and she's doing illustrations, you know. And he had her, like you said, he had her on a retainer on the school payroll. And eventually, uh, the, the, I guess the school's accounting department began looking into this. Just at the end of the year, they look at everybody's expenses, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and when they looked at his, they saw this woman, Robin Benedict, who they had never met. Uh, but apparently she was doing a lot of work and making a lot of money. So they they called him out. They, they said, who is this Robin Benedict? You know, we need to meet her. And that was when the story started to crumble. You know, he, he started to panic. Because simultaneously, when this was going on, she was losing interest in him. Yeah. So he had both things to deal with. The school was starting to investigate him, and she was losing interest in him. He had become too obsessive. And he was also running out of money, so she was losing interest in him for that reason, too. Yeah. She, she would put up with the obsession as long as the money was coming in. Well, indeed. And also people were, the other um, ladies were jealous, is that correct, of Robin? Because she was getting all this money from this, not only all this money, but her attitude started to change almost like I'm the top person in this joint. Yeah, exactly. A lot of the, a lot of the other uh, sex workers in that neighborhood, they didn't have nice things to say about Robin. Um, you know, they thought she was a bit arrogant and... Uh, you know, she was um, a bit pushy and, like you said, you know, acting like she was the uh, the queen at Good Time Charlie's, you know. And a lot of those all the other women, they'd been there a couple of years longer and they didn't like the idea that this young kid was, you know, acting like such a, you know, big shot. And she was also very brazen, you know. She, bec she became really good at working the uh the customers um and like if if you were a girl and you were talking to a potential <laughs> client in the bar robin could just come along and take the guy away with just a little nod of her head a wink of the eye she became that confident and cocky and the other girls started to uh not like that aspect either you know so yeah she was um getting a bit a bit big for herself, you know? So, as you said uh, a few minutes ago, the relationship has developed, but then Robin starting to get sick of the professor and the professor started realizing this. So he started doing some weird things, such as call, she would get phone calls from police and saying, oh, we're gonna search your house. And you wonder where the phone call comes from. And he actually came from him and he's watching around the corner. So he started doing weird things like that. Is that correct? Yeah, he would, uh, he became jealous of her. And if he knew she was with another guy that night, he would call the police and have her busted. <laughs> he would call the police and, and say, yeah, there's this prostitute named Robin Benedict. She's, you know, she's with a guy up, up in her apartment. You know, she's a prostitute. <laughs> and uh, 
she he had her arrested probably numerous times. Um, but the strange thing was that she could always work her way out of it, you know. Um, so I, I've talked to, you know, the few policemen who are still alive because this case happened a long time ago. Mm-hmm. A lot of the people I wanted to talk to have passed away. But some of the policemen who are still alive, they think she may have had some kind of deal going with the police as well where you know they would never really arrest her you know they would they would bring her in to the station but uh, they might take her photograph but they always let her off with a warning you know and this was a girl who usually had cocaine in her purse this was a girl who was uh you know made she did not hide the fact that she was a prostitute and yet she was never really in big trouble. Uh, so there, there were a lot of strange things going on with the police, um, you know, who, who would just let her go, you know. And Douglas, uh, there was another theory that Douglas was somehow, you know, in, in league with the police where he would, you know, he would say, I'll... I'll you know, I'll tell you everything I know um, as long as you, you know, don't ever arrest me for, you know, being in the combat zone or, you know, being with a, a prostitute. You know, don't I'll tell I'll give you secrets. You know, um, there were theories. They they were never really investigated. Um, but a lot of the people I spoke to for the book, they you know, they just look back at Boston as, you know, one tangled uh, web of of you know, controversy and, and corruption, you know, where the police were working with the prostitutes and the FBI was working with the mafia. You know, there was a lot of, a lot of corruption going on in those days. Crazy, crazy. And we've talked about how he affected his academic and professional life, but he also affected his family's life because obviously he's doing these things um, outside of marriage and, Surely his wife must have known, or did she? Or did she know? But as you say, she seemed to be very meek and just didn't care as long as they were still married. Kept at the front end, and she didn't mind. Yeah, I I think his wife uh, knew what was going on, and she looked the other way uh, for as long as she could. Uh, I I think uh, at, at some point she did start to to break, and and. I think she did eventually say, you know, you've got to stop. And and some people have said there were there were cases where he did stop for a while. Um, but I as I looked into the book, I didn't believe it. I don't think he ever quite stopped. Um, I think he just got better at keeping it a secret. Mm-hmm. You know, like he would tell his wife, OK, honey, we'll work things out, you know. But I, I don't think he ever stopped uh, obsessing over Robin or prostitutes in general. Um, he, he when, when she didn't want to see him anymore, he just, you know, started seeing other prostitutes, you know. Um, so it did affect his personal life um, or, and his, his professional life too. At school, he was uh, looking bad, looking unhealthy. Uh, you know, he actually had a, a, a couch moved into his office uh, so he could take naps because he was staying up all night, you know, with Robin, the two of them starting cocaine all night, you know? Um, so he would have a, he bought a couch and put it in his office so he could take naps <laughs> during the day. Uh, so his, his work life was suffering. His uh, married life was suffering. Uh, a lot of problems when you're, uh, you know, stuck in the combat zone and, and it seems no way out yeah so obviously now something's happened and she goes missing who actually reported her missing and just summarize what the police investigation was like in regards to finding her well she disappeared yeah. suddenly no one saw robin benedict and it was her pimp who 
came to the police and said, he said, well, my girlfriend is missing. Yeah. That That's how he put it, you know. And, you know, it, it didn't take, it didn't take the police long to figure out that he was a pimp and Robin was a prostitute and she was missing. So they weren't too concerned at first. They just assumed, well, prostitute left her pimp. You know, we're, we're not going to work too hard to solve this one. You know, the prostitute probably just left, you know, went out of state, didn't want to deal with this guy anymore, you know. Um, but simultaneously with that, uh, a couple of men were on the highway going through uh, garbage dumpsters. Um, uh, I think in England they call them bins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those big metal, we, we call them dumpsters. Uh, so back then it was a new thing where if uh, you could find enough bottles, you could cash them in yeah. uh, at, you know, a little bit of money. And, but if you found enough, you, you could, uh, you know, have enough to buy uh, some beer and, and cigarettes and, and, and uh, you know, have a good time for the weekend. It was a new bill that had recently been passed uh, in Massachusetts called the Bottle Bill. Um, so it was not uncommon to see men early in the morning digging through dumpsters and trash cans, uh, trying to find empty bottles. And there were a couple of guys on the highway going through a bin and they found a hammer covered in blood <laughs> and some bloody clothing wrapped around it. So they, one of the guys thought we should call the police about this. This doesn't look right. So word got out that a bloody hammer had been found in a bin on the highway and it sounded suspicious. So it was a Sunday morning, not much going on. So a couple of state troopers were sent out to take a look at this bloody hammer. So they brought it in as evidence and they kept that bloody hammer in a, in a, in a you know, plastic bag <laughs> for, for a few days, you know, not sure what it meant. And eventually they were able to trace it to Douglas. It was a hammer that belonged to his father-in-law. Um, and apparently he had borrowed it. He borrowed it to do some work in the house. Now it was covered in blood. And uh, that became a big part of the story, uh, this, this hammer. Um, the pimp gave Douglas his name to the police and said the last client that Robin was going to see was this man, William Douglas, who lived out in the suburbs at the time. She was making a personal visit, you know, and he said, you got to investigate this guy, Douglas. So that's, that's what led the police to Douglas. And, and uh, they raided his home which is a, another story in itself, just the, the raid on Douglas's home, you know. <clears throat> um, and that was, that sort of begins the, the second half of the story of just, you know, uh, the police investigating Douglas very, became just more and more, more and more complex, more, more and more dirt to dig through. With the raid in the home, was it discovered later that he actually committed the murder at the home, even though he didn't find a body? Was it at the home where he actually committed the murder? Which seems actually very brazen, if you think about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, they uh, what they found in his home, they, they, uh, they were looking through his clothing, and they found a coat. And inside the coat was uh, just a, a very tiny speck of what turned out to be part of a human brain. <laughs> okay and they they uh they took it to a laboratory and they eventually asked him you know there's a piece of a human brain in your pocket you know how how do you explain that you know um so just that little bit of a brain became uh you know a major piece of evidence uh to to eventually uh uh, put him before the grand jury and indict him for murder. A little tiny speck of brain. 
That's horrible. So they've suspected him. They still ha- at this point they still haven't found a body. That's correct. They haven't found a body at all. No, he uh, he did a good job of hiding it, and it was uh, gruesome. It was a grim, you know, very grim story, um, and sad in a lot of ways too, be- because they never did find what happened to Robin. He told a story. He gave his confession. Um, but uh, I, as I put it in the book, the story that we know is the story that he told, not necessarily the truth. And he never he never told the story under oath. He gave this confession in a back room. <laughs> you know, he didn't give it in court. Um, and to me, obviously, it was a story that he concocted with his attorneys. Mm-hmm. And his attorney was quite a character, too, uh, a guy named Thomas Troy. Um, this this confession, you know, he, I don't want to give too much of it away. I want to save some of it for, you know, if anyone wants to buy the book and, and read it. But, you know, he made this confession that she attacked him. She had the hammer. She attacked him, yeah. demanding money, demanding payment. She was greedy and hostile and she attacked him and he, in self-defense, he took the hammer away and and hit her, you know? So he made up this story to make it sound like she was the villain, you know? And it seems a lot of people believed it. A lot of people believed it because at the time, you know, now with the me too movement and all of that kind of, uh, publicity that's in the air over the Me Too movement. Uh, I, I don't know if he would have gotten away with that sort of confession. Oh, she attacked me. <laughs> you know, it was all her fault. That's why I beat her brains in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems a very a stretch. And it seemed to be a stretch for the jury as well because they found him guilty. He went to prison. But ironically, he actually kind of turned his life around in prison, especially in terms of helping other people. Would that be accurate to say? Well, he uh, took advantage of the good behavior uh, benefits of prison, where they sentenced him. He was sentenced, um, and he he didn't go before a jury. He, He did a plea bargain where he said, I'll confess, and I'll show you where the body is, if you don't charge me with murder, instead make it manslaughter, which was a lesser penalty, you know, uh, and he's, you know, she attacked me. I defended myself. So it's manslaughter. It wasn't murder, you know, um, and all the lawyers agreed and the family agreed. Uh, Robin's family agreed because they thought they were going to find the body. Yeah. They never did. They never found the body. You know, he he would take them to where he thought he left the body and, you know, it was in a dump and and, uh, you know, it was impossible to find. Uh, I think they could have found it, but everybody seemed to back off. The investigators backed off, the lawyers backed off, the search backed off. I think and I say this in the book, I I think they backed off a bit easily Um, because other bodies have been found in dumps. You know, it's not, this wouldn't be the first time people searched in a dump. I mean, I, I found one case in another state where they found a body, they, you know, a, a couple of people with shovels and a dog were, were, were able to find a body. But for some reason, in 1983, they didn't want to look for this body, maybe because she was a prostitute, maybe because they just wanted to end the case, mm-hmm. get it over with, get it off the books. Um, but he went to prison and took advantage of the good behavior uh, benefits where they would, you know, chop off time every time he, you know, took a class or taught a class or, you know, did something nice for somebody in prison. Uh, He was really, you know, working the system. He was a smart man. He was working the system. And he uh, got out of prison in about half the time. He only served about half of his sentence. And that outraged a lot of people. Um, 
and it actually ended up changing laws. Uh, new laws were were brought in to make sure that if, if you were sentenced to 20 years, you did 20 years. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you couldn't just, you know, help create a mural for the prison kitchen and, and, and knock off a year of your sentence. You know, um, if you if you were sentenced to 20, you did 20. That became a law in Massachusetts and other states too had already been doing it. But Massachusetts uh, was still relying heavily on good behavior. Um, there are always ways around things. If smart, smarter people can always find a loophole somewhere, you know, uh, and he worked the system. Um, you know, I, I almost found myself, I don't want to say I admired him, but I thought, man, he's, you know, people thought he was just going to die in prison, you know, um, because he was this sort of soft old professor. He ended up doing well. He, he was, you know, not uh nobody was pushing him around in prison you know he kind of found a way to make himself uh you know i don't want to say he was like a top dog you know surviving but he survived he he knew how to do it he knew how to get by what happened to his wife after he went to prison was there anything that you found out about that well she divorced him she tried to she stayed with him for a while uh, after he was in prison, but eventually uh, they split. Yeah. And he ended up marrying another woman. You know, murderers can always find a woman, it seems. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Um, and finally, well, very quickly, um, without revealing the ending of the book, in a way, he, f- like, a lot of people forgot about the crimes, as you said at the beginning, and he ironically actually forgot about what actually happened. <laughs> Correct. It, you know, that that's uh, it, it's interesting that uh, he he started uh, coming down with um, you know mental illnesses as as he got older. Uh, so he he didn't really enjoy a lengthy uh, time out of prison. Uh, he had a few good years and then, you know, fairly early on, he was only in his 60s. He started to experience uh, memory problems, men- mental problems, uh, um, infirmities. And he ended up in a nursing home for, you know, people who couldn't look after themselves. So, yeah, th- there is there is a possibility that he forgot all about Robin Benedict. <laughs> he, f- he forgot the whole thing. You know, uh, I, I don't know what people remember when they're that stricken. You know, maybe certain parts of their lives they can still remember. But if you forget your wife and your children and you can't recognize them, you know, when, when the dementia is that bad, if you can't remember your family, you probably forget that you killed somebody. <laughs> you know, you might forget everything. Maybe it's, a, it's just a clean slate in there. You don't remember anything, you know. Um, so yeah, he, in a way he did sort of come to a bad end, even if he didn't, uh, spend the rest of his life, uh, behind bars. Agreed. Just quickly, um, one more question in regards yeah. to the press, how did the press actually report the crime back then? And how would you compare to how to report it now? Cause you mentioned the Me Too movement. So mm. I imagine some of the reporting, how to report it then wouldn't necessarily be allowed now. Oh, it, back then it started out as it, it, it kept changing the tone of the coverage. First, it was kind of a mysterious case about this missing girl. You know, where did she go? You know, what happened to her? And then it was revealed that she'd had a relationship with this older professor. Uh, they didn't want to come out and say she was a prostitute because that would change the whole story then eventually they did they revealed that she was a prostitute and suddenly the case had a title the professor and the prostitute right uh headlines you know so it became a big case um and it flip-flopped uh at times they portrayed him as the villain 
And then they portrayed her as the villain and that, you know, they portrayed her as, you know, leading this man down, you know, this, this dark path, you know, uh, the, the press was sort of painting her as, as the villain in the, in the story. And he was this, you know, well-meaning professor who had been, you know, brought down by this, you know, evil sex worker, you know, uh, I, I don't think you would get away with that sort of coverage now. Um, but back then it sold a lot of newspapers. Uh, and I also thought there was sort of a beauty in the beast kind of angle yeah. that they went with because they would always put, you know, a picture of her right next to a picture of him. So you saw that this, you know, attractive young woman and this, you know, sort of, overblown stuffy looking professor you know and i and they were playing up the, the beauty and the beast and then they played up the jekyll and hyde thing too where you know he was you know dr jekyll but at night he turned into mr hyde it was prowling around in the combat zone you know so the the tone of the story uh they they kept finding new angles to 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 approach it from and now you know Nowadays, I don't know if it would be such a big story. I, I think the idea that, you know, people have secret sex lives, I don't think that's as big a deal now. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, if, you know, with some people it would be, uh, but not all across the board. Um, um, so that part of it wouldn't be as big a deal. Uh, you know, a, a prostitute being murdered probably would not be considered uh, a major story now. Um, a, a lot of aspects of the story that were so big in, you know, 1983 uh, would sort of be thought of as uh, run of the mill now. You know, might not get a second glance. Um, but... The mysterious aspect of it, of, of where the body went, yeah. I think that might still appeal to people now. You know, all of the uh, all of the podcasters who love true crime stories now, uh, I think they would have something to focus on with just the missing body, and they would have plenty of theories to to bang around. Yeah. So I think in that respect that part of the story would, would still be big now. A missing body is always big, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. It's been, it's certainly a unique case because I'm a big fan of true crime and it was certainly something that had me enthralled all throughout. So it's a fascinating book, I say. Busting Tabloid, The Killing of Robin Benedict. I highly recommend it to anyone. If people want to find out more about your or your work, not just this book, where can they find it? Well, I think the best bet would be just to, uh, you know, go on, you know, go on Amazon and uh, you, you can follow me on Amazon. Um, and I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to update. I had a blog that I used to use purely as a boxing <laughs> blog because I was a boxing writer for so many years. And I had a blog where I would write about uh, boxing um, and I may I may try to update it and put more of my true crime uh, material on there because uh, I have another book that I'm working on um, that will probably come out uh, next year with a, a different publisher. Uh, um, I have a bunch of little projects that are percolating, so I may revamp my blog a little bit. Um, and I'm on what is now called X. I still call it Twitter. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I I don't use it as much as I once did. And at the rate X is going, I, I don't know if any of us will still be using it uh, in the future. <laughs> I have no, I, I have no idea what will happen with X. Um, but if anybody is interested, uh, I occasionally uh, post things on X. We used to call them tweets. What, what do they call them now? I think they call them post. And Just posts. Yeah. Of any few, re, what we used to be retweets, you could repost now. So right. Yeah. Right. It'll just right. give me another few months and I'll get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and until they start making us pay for it, pay, pay for our posts. <laughs> yeah, that's coming. That's definitely coming. Absolutely. But um, again, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, all the best with this book and all the best with your projects for uh, next year. 
Thank you, Chris. It's always good to uh, chat. I always enjoy talking to people from uh, the United Kingdom. I've had I've had the opportunity to do it a few times with with other books, and I even appeared on a a, a British uh, radio program uh, last year. I I, I I always appreciate it. Um, Ireland, uh, I, I have uh, a good time uh, talking with uh, the folks over there. I think I think you appreciate books a little more. Yes. Uh, I think it's still a big part of the culture, reading. You know, uh, uh, Americans, uh, maybe a little bit less so. So I'm always uh, interested to, to chat with uh, anybody from, from your side of the world. It's always great. Just quickly then, you say that. Are you saying that boxing books or sports books in general aren't as appreciated in America as they were, say, 20, 30 years ago? Or is that, is that just a cultural thing in general? I think uh, reading, just reading yeah. for pleasure. Uh, reading for pleasure, I think, has diminished a bit in America. Um, I, 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 there, was a, there was a time where I remember, you know, my dad always had a, a paperback book in his yeah. pocket. You know what I mean? Or, or uh, you know, it was just, uh, you know, men, men, basically, men used to read a lot more than they do now. Um, when you think of all those authors, you know, like Mickey Spillane and, and you know, Ernest Hemingway and, and Norman Mailer. I mean, th these were authors who had a primarily male audience, you know, and uh, the young male readership, I, I think, has diminished. Uh, you know, on, on the other side of the coin, there are more women involved now in publishing and, and writing and reading. And uh, so the, the, the scales have changed a bit. Um, but uh, I think in America, reading for pleasure is not what it used to be. Uh, I have no scientific proof of this, mm -hmm. but, but it's, it's a gut instinct that I have. Yeah. But I, I noticed in England, people want to talk about the book to a greater degree yeah yeah they, they 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 like the details they they uh they they just have more um uh just more of a feel for wanting to get into it you know um you know in, in america i'll be in a podcast and, the, and they'll just say you know oh that was awesome that was an awesome book how, how long how long did it take to write <laughs> you know and and uh um but in England, it's, it's a little, they're, they're a little more uh, scholarly, maybe uh, just a little payment. They pay a little more attention to detail. I like that. It's, it's, it's good to know that, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to have a conversation, you know, and yeah. I, I, I could, I sense that coming on today. I thought, yeah, you know, Chris is probably going to, you know, talk it up and, and we'll have, we'll have a good chat and I'll, I'll like that. Absolutely. I say it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. All the best we've, this book and your book next year, all right? And uh, yeah. wish you all and, the best. And, and good luck with your blog, continued success. Oh, cool. All right, cheers. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.